but Arndt, not feeling secure at Thorn after such an attack, left the town. In 1724, Garrett, senior collegi ministerium, published a work in which he maintained that religion and politics should be kept separate and that neither clergymen should mingle in civil affairs nor laymen interfere with those of religion. Well, that's absolutely contrary to our biblical doctrine of resisting evil and exposing evil. The minister of God is to absolutely be in the political arena, pointing his finger at the men who would seek to subvert the nation in which he is a member and citizen. That is his duty as a minister of the gospel as well as a citizen of that country. The greatest offenders of nationality, of nationhood, of sovereign nations are the preachers of the gospel, or at least they should be. That's how the Calvinists were. Continuing, the Jesuits who acted quite in in a contrary manner considered it as a reflection on their conduct and denounced the work as a libel against the Pope and the Polish nation. Well, uh, I think Garrett here was trying to keep the Jesuits out of politics. So the Jesuits attacked him. And again, uh, the Jesuits should be kept out of politics. They should not be allowed in any sort of political arena because they're traitors. They're subverters. They're, they're overthrowers of national sovereignties. There's not one Jesuit who believes that any nation has a right to govern itself apart from being overseen by the Pope. There's not one in existence. It's called the doctrine of the temporal power. Continuing, Garrett prevented prevented condemnation by a voluntary exile. So what does he do? He runs away. Ephraim Olaf, too, a learned minister, was obliged to do the same for having expressed a wish that the whole population of Thorn might be subject to the gospel. That's what I preach. I preach everybody ought to be subject to the gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ of the gospel, not to any church, but to the gospel as revealed in the Bible. So therefore, this guy was threatened, and he fled the town of Thorn. Such was the disposition of mind amongst the inhabitants of Thorn when the following event, which produced a most painful sensation throughout all Europe, took place. A Roman Catholic procession was going round the churchyard of St. James Church in the new town, July 16th. There was an ordinance that all persons, without regard to their religious persuasion, should uncover their heads in sign of respect when they met with the host publicly carried. That's this little Jesus cookie turned into the literal body of Christ. Okay, That they have to uncover their heads even if they're Protestants and Bible believers. That's called the union of church and state. That's called making people Roman Catholic. That's something that the Baptist First Amendment prevents. And this is why the Jesuits hate the First Amendment. Many children of the Protestant inhabitants were standing outside of the walls of the churchyard when the procession was going on within its enclosure. They took off their hats when the host approached, but this sign of respect to a Roman Catholic religious ceremony shown by Protestants did not satisfy the students of the Jesuit college. And one of them exacted that the Protestants should bend their knees, and when it was refused, he attacked and ill-treated one of the boys. The Jesuits did not restrain the violence of their pupils, and the procession finished without any disturbance. Yeah, because you see, the Jesuits are the great agitators of states. They're great agitators. I have many sources to prove that. But the same evening, the Jesuits' pupils renewed an attack on the students of the Protestant college when they assailed with stones and sticks. The Protestants, being in a smaller number, gave way to their assailants, But the town guards dispersed the rioters, of whom one was seized and imprisoned. Peter Szyszewski, the rector of the Jesuits' college, immediately summoned the president of the town, Rossner, to give up the rioter. But this was refused, as the council of the city was to judge the affair on the following day. The Jesuit students, however, made an attempt to deliver their comrade by... by force, and armed with swords, attacked the burghers of the city. This is why Roman Catholics shouldn't be allowed to own guns. 
because they will ultimately use those guns against Protestants and Baptists and anybody that resists the temporal power of the Pope. I know that's a revolutionary statement here in North America, but hey, you're loyal to a foreign sovereign, man. You can't own arms. And Ed, and Harris, the, 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 the general that was at the trial of the Lincoln assassins, when they uh, condemned eight people, uh, Thomas Harris said, no Roman Catholic should be allowed in America because they have an allegiance to the Pope of Rome. And by that, they're a traitor. That's what General Thomas Harris said in Rome's participation in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. But when they have the opportunity with their swords, where they're going to attack a legitimate government or they're going to attack Protestants and Baptists, that's why we have to be insane to give up our guns. On this occasion, they captured the leader of the students and repelled the attack of his comrades when they tried to liberate him. Meanwhile, the city council ordered the student first taken to be set free, but did not liberate the second prisoner. The Romanists in the evening seized on a Protestant student who was quietly standing in his nightgown before the door of the house in which he lived, treated him very ill, and carried him to the Jesuits College, uttering threats against his life. Wonderful Jesuit order, isn't it? It's the Jesuit order that runs this country. The Burgermeister called on the rector to liberate him, and the rector, in his turn, demanded that the rioters still in custody should be previously liberated, thereby declaring that he approved in some respects of the violence of his students. The populace composed of Protestants, which had heretofore taken no part in these proceedings, then assembled in crowds before the Jesuits' college, but still remained quiet, so they're not causing any trouble. The pupils, however, began to throw stones at them from the windows of the college. Typical Jesuit pupils, violent fighters, fornicators and fighters. I was raised with Roman Catholics, folks. And all that matters to the vast majority of Roman Catholics is who can whip whose butt and who's getting sex from who. I lived it. I grew up in Terra Hills, California. Terra Hills was a Roman Catholic conclave. An Irish Roman Catholic woman sold off her property. And one of the conditions for development of Terra Hills was that every street had to have a Roman Catholic name. C Cornelius, Kevin, Flannery. I grew up on Limerick Road, 2700 Limerick Road. I was raised with Italian Catholics, Irish Catholics, Polish Catholics, Portuguese Catholics. And I tell you, all that matters is who can whip who and who's having sex with who. Kind of like the majority of the black communities. Amen? Can I get a witness? Going on. The Burgermeister called on the rector to liberate him, and the rector in his turn demanded that the writer still in custody should be previously liberated thereby declaring that he approved in some respects of the violence of his students. So the Jesuit rector approved of the violence of his students. The populace, composed of Protestants, which had heretofore taken no part in these proceedings, then assembled in crowds before the Jesuits' college, but still remained quiet. The pupils, however, began to throw stones at them from the windows of the college. The people became irritated, forced an entrance into the college, and are said to have delivered the Protestant student from his prison, though it is very likely that the Jesuits themselves, afraid of the incensed crowd, liberated him. So these Polish Protestants did the right thing. They liberated one of their brethren from a Jesuit college that, that, that they threatened to kill this Protestant Pole. Meanwhile, the town militia, having arrived, drove back the crowd and surrounded the college. About eight in the morning, when order was completely restored, the students, thinking themselves secure by the presence of the militia, which guarded the entrance of the college, assailed the people who were dispersing quietly with stones and even firearms. So the Jesuit students started shooting at the people and throwing rocks at them. This produced a violent excitement amongst the crowd, which furiously attacked the college. Amen and glory, hallelujah. The judge, in fact, the, the, the militia should have attacked the college immediately. He started shooting those students who were firing arms and throwing rocks. Shoot them! And arrest the Jesuit fathers there and try them for treason and put them to death. That's what should have been done. The Jesuits in alarm sounded the toxin. 
But notwithstanding the opposition of the town militia and the firing kept up from the college, the populace took possession of the premises, broke into pieces the furniture which they found, and having carried it into the street, burned it. No murder or pillage was, however, committed. Back in a moment. This is 24-7 World Radio. World Radio. You're listening to 24-7 World Radio. Continuing with the reading of a sketch of the Reformation in Poland from a work printed in English titled Historical Sketch of the Rise, Progress, and Decline of the Reformation in Poland in English, written in the 1800s. Continuing. No murder or pillage was, however, committed by the Protestants against the Jesuits or the Catholics. When the Jesuits were threatening murder of a Protestant man, when the Jesuits had captured him, kidnapped him, and brought him into one of their colleges. Now, I'm telling you Polish people this so that you can know that the Jesuits have not changed. And these sinners ran Poland after the Jesuits used the NKVD to kill approximately 200,000 Polish, pardon me, Polish men, policemen, political leaders. And they used primarily in the Katyn massacre of thousands, they used the Soviet NKVD that was run by the Jesuits. The Katyn massacre was a Jesuit massacre of Polish men who would have fought to their last breath to resist the invading Hitler and the invading Stalinist armies. As the Poles had set back Stalin in 1920, now it was vengeance. These Polish men that dared to set back Joseph Stalin and the Bolsheviks in the 1920s, why now we're going to kill them in the Katyn massacre of the late 1930s overseen by Joseph Stalin and carried out by his NKVD run by Jesuits, financed and enabled to do this by London and Washington, Mm -hmm. both run by Jesuits. Going on. A stronger detachment of town militia guards and some regular troops having arrived, the people dispersed without resistance. And these are the Protestants. They dispersed without resistance. And at 11 o'clock, order was completely restored. Such is the report presented by the municipality of Thorn to the Supreme Tribunal of Towns at Warsaw. It is, however, our duty to give the account of the Romanist writers who maintain that the people, having taken possession of the college, broke the legs of a crucifix, cut into pieces the altar of the Immaculate Conception of the Holy Virgin, pierced with swords the image of the Savior, as well as those of some of the saints, and the host was thrown upon the ground, and that the Jesuit who tried to prevent the sacrilege was threatened with death. The greatest insult, however, was, according to that relation, this Jesuit narration, offered to an image of the Blessed Virgin, which was torn to pieces and thrown into the fire, quote, amidst scoffing exclamations, unquote. They maintain also, quote, that everything was pillaged and threats uttered of massacring the Jesuits and all the Roman Catholics, that the President Rossner had not done his duty on that occasion by adopting the necessary measures for quelling it, and that the Vice President Zernicki even countenanced the disturbers instead of, quote, quieting the riot, unquote. That's a lie, and there's never been a my understanding, a study of any of this history, where the Protestants call for a mass murder of Roman Catholics. That has never happened. And if you think it has, you email me at eric at vaticanassassins.org, and you tell me, you give me the historical citation for that, because I don't know of one. And I've studied this for 30 years. But there's been plenty of Roman Catholics incited by the Jesuits calling for the massacre of all Protestants which I document many times in my book. So the Jesuits are liars. They're not only murderers, they're liars. They're just like their father, the devil. Liar and a murderer he was from the beginning. So what are they doing? They're trying to incite Roman Catholic rage against the Protestants of Poland. Continuing on.
that the President Rossner had not done his duty on that occasion by adopting the necessary measures for quelling it, and that the Vice President Zernicki even countenanced the disturbers instead of quieting the riot. Well, that's just simply not true. All these accusations are denied by Protestant writers who condemn the riot and the outrages committed by the populace, but maintain that there was no truth in the burning of the images. Some even suppose that the mutilation of the images to have been the work of the Jesuits themselves or their agents, and that thereby they might excite hatred against the Protestants. This is what they did on 9-11. They blame 9-11 on the Muslims. So they can incite hatred against the Muslims in this country to go fight a crusade for the lasting now 15 years. This is a Jesuit design using their Jesuit-controlled Night of Malt Demand Central Intelligence Agency and NSA. It's the same game. And by the way, you know there's a room in NSA called the Jew Room. And in that room in NSA called the Jew Room, no Jew is allowed. And that's according to Loftus in his work, The Secret, his secret War Against the Jews. Oh, it sounds to me like the Jews don't run the country. It's the Jesuits who run the country and inciting all this anti-Muslim fury and bringing the Muslims into Europe and bringing the Muslims over here and then inciting them to riot and rape and pillage so that the population can be incited to kill them all. That's exactly what's being done here. The high Muslim leader is working for the Pope. It's like the high American leaders working for the Pope. It's like the high German leaders, Merkel, that prostitute, working for the Pope. Like the high English leaders, like Queen Elizabeth II, that prostitute, working for the Pope. All pimps and whores for the Pope. Killing down targeted populations, as was the case here in Poland. The Jesuits spread all over Poland a printed account of what they gave out as a sacrilege, representing to the nation the insult offered to the divine the divine majesty calling out for exemplary vengeance on the Protestants of Thorn. And in the footnote it has, agitation set up by the Jesuits over all the country in order to incite the public opinion against the Protestants of Thorn. And recommending that the churches and schools should be taken from them and together with the government of the city be handed over to Romanists. to the Roman Catholics, to the Romanists devoted to the Jesuits. Romanists like Joe Biden, devoted, utterly devoted to the Jesuits. Jesuits like John Boehner, utterly devoted to the Jesuits. Jesuits like Sean Hannity and Bill O'Reilly, utterly devoted to the Jesuits. Little Romanists like them. Their narrative, although supported by no other evidence than that of accusing the accusing party, produce a strong effect on public opinion. You know why? Because the public is generally stupid, like it is here in America. They believe what the newspaper says instead of saying, you know, what really happened? The American public in this country is so deluded that they actually believe that the Muslims caused 9-11. That's got to be the epitome of blindness and stupidity. Just will believe what Whatever the government tells us and whatever the press tells us, because you see, they're looking out for us, aren't they? Huh? Wrong. The press never told you who killed Kennedy. The press never told you who really shot Reagan inside the vehicle. It was Jerry Parr. It wasn't Hinckley. The press never told you about 9-11. The press never told you who killed Malcolm X. The press never told you who killed Martin Luther King. The press never told you who killed Bobby Kennedy. The press isn't going to tell you because it's run by the Jesuits through their Council on Foreign Relations. Why would you believe anything the news has to tell you? Continuing. Produced a strong effect on public opinion, and the consequent excitement was so great that at the elections which were then proceeding, the con constituencies enjoined their representatives not to begin any transaction before the offended majesty of God should be avenged. No kind of agitation, indeed, was omitted that could inspire fanatical hatred against the Protestants of Thorn. See it? That's how the Jesuits are. The Jesuits hate Protestants. You know who they hate the most? They hate the white Protestants and Baptists of the American South. That's who they hate the most. And they want to depict them as nothing but a bunch of vicious slaveholders raping their women, killing the slaves, whipping the slaves. 
when only 6% of the white people in the South had slaves and there were many black slaveholders. Oh, no, we got to incite a rage against the white Protestant and Baptist peoples of the South so that we can incite a race war one of these days and incite all the blacks to rise up and kill them. That's what we want to do. That's what we did in Haiti. That's what we did in Haiti and Hispanola in 1799. Why we want to do it here in the American South, too. The Jesuits are the great haters and agitators of states, then in Poland and in today in America. Agents sent for that purpose circulated all over the country, prints which represented the sacrilege and exhibited images damaged by fire. Public fasts and prayers were ordered by the clergy and the pulpit, as well as the confessional, were converted into powerful engines of agitation. And those Protestants should have stood up in their pulpits and said they're liars, they're telling lies about us, and we're going to publish and print and preach right against them. That's what should have been done. There was no lack of miracles. Nay, it was said that the broken images had emitted blood, etc. Against the vast and organized system of agitation, the Protestants of Thorn had no other defense than their innocence. And they were so thoroughly convinced of the goodness of their cause that those most easily alarmed contemplated not only a pecuniary fine levied on the city for the damage done to the college of the Jesuits, which the Jesuits probably did anyway. The king ordered this affair to be investigated. Investigated. By a special commission consisting exclusively of Romanists. Well, that's nice. That's kind of like having everybody that's going to inve investigate the 9-11, uh, put them on a 9-11 commission and make them all counts on foreign relations members loyal to the Archbishop of New York. That's why they appointed Henry Killinger. That's what they call him in Cyprus, Henry Killinger, not Henry Kissinger. Because Kissinger was the one who brought in the Turks to kill thousands, tens of thousands of Cypriot Orthodox people when they invaded in 1974. The Jesuits controlling that little Turkish invasion. That's right. You Jesuits run the Turks. It was composed of the bishops of Kajuvia and Pluck, the Palatins of Combe, Pomerania and Marienburg, and several other dignitaries, civil as well as ecclesiastical. The proceedings of the commission were open on the 18th of September and went on with some order as long as the Bishop of Pluck, Zaluski, and the Palatine of Kolm, Rabinsky, who wished to conduct the investigation on the principles of right and law, were present. But as soon as they had retired, with some other members animated by similar feelings, all the proceedings were directed by the Bishop of Kajuvia and Prince Lobomirsky, Chamberlain of the Crown, and it was done with a complete disregard of every principle of truth and justice. That's what you have when you have Jesuits in your courts. That's what you have when you have Jesuit controlled presidents appointing federal district judges. You might as well consider every federal district judge a Jesuit. That's right. Because they're upholding the military government established on March 9, 1933 by Jesuit Edmund Walsh using Franklin damnable 32nd degree Freemason Roosevelt. And by the way, Michael Savage will never tell you this. Alex Jones will never tell you this. Going on. The witnesses presented by the city council were rejected as accomplices, but all those who appeared to give evidence against the accused party were admitted. Without any regard to their characters and the most absurd statements accepted as soon as they were confirmed by an oath. The Jesuits selected the persons who were to be accused. The evidence was often contradictory. And when some witnesses did not give the evidence required, the Jesuits interfered, calling out, quote, you have said otherwise to us, unquote. See the tyrants that they are? When a woman retracted her evidence given against the burger, Wintish, the retraction was rejected. This woman, Wintish, the retraction was rejected because she had confirmed her former deposition by an oath and Wintish was executed. So, no, pardon me, uh, the burger was Wintish. And so this woman that wanted to retract her evidence, she ref they refused to the retraction. And so they took this burger, Wintish, and killed him over lying testimony of some pape, some Roman Catholic witch subject to the Jesuits. It's like that witch, Mary Surratt. 
involved in the conspiracy to assassinate Abraham Lincoln. God for her innocence the whole time. I never did anything wrong. And that priest Jacob, what was Jacob, uh, last name of... It's in my book. He was there confessing her at the gallows. And this innocent woman, Mary Surratt, was murdered by the government. And which Thomas Harris came out and said, that's a bold-faced lie. The great general that was on the military commission that sentenced that witch to death. See? You've got to resist these people, I'm telling you. If you don't resist them, they'll take your lunch money. They'll take your life. They'll take everything you've ever been blessed with, as they did here in Poland. And as they've done here in America. And my question is, when are you going to wake up and start doing something about it? White men who believe the gospel? You need to send, and I'll continue with this. Even the evidence of witnesses who confessed that they had not seen the facts, which they stated, but had only heard of them, was considered conclusive. That's called hearsay evidence. Hearsay evidence is not admitted in any legitimate court taken evidence. But with the Jesuits, oh no, we'll take hearsay evidence. Like that. You need to expose these people and help me do it. Send your donations to RBT, Reformation Bible Trust, P.O. Box 306, New Manstown, Pennsylvania, 17073. Send your checks, money orders, gifts, or you can sign up as to be a monthly contributor. Go to 247worldadia.com, you can sign up as a monthly supporter. I ask 50 bucks a month from white men who truly want to resist this white power structure of the Pope and for anybody else who wants to side with us. But I need your help. I need your gifts. I need your donations because I'm not stopping. This is going to be continually exposed until the Lord calls me out of here, until I breathe my last or bleed my last. In either event, they're going to continue to be exposed because they're going to kill millions of people here in the 21st century if their power is not set back. Will you help me set it back? By, by surely telling the truth about it and that God would raise up men of power and wealth and in government to resist the Jesuits? That one newscaster, what's his name? Uh, he was on, uh, oh, I can't remember his name now. His face is right in front of me. But he talked about the Jesuits. Jesuit casualty. Lou Dobbs. He even spoke about him once. We need to resist them. Again, send your donations to RBT, P.O. Box 306, Newmanstown, Pennsylvania, 17073. Pray for me. Pray the Lord will protect me and help me with this matter. Send up other supporters, help other men to help me and come to my cause, help come to their cause. It's our cause. If we're Bible-believing, Protestants and Baptists, having been born again, and true nationalists, we need to help. Back in a moment, continuing this reading concerning destruction of the Reformation in Poland. You're listening to 24-7 World Radio. Brother Eric John Fells continuing on with our reading from our great work here, titled Historical Sketch of the Rise, Progress, and Decline of the Reformation in Poland. Two volumes, and it's a tremendous work. So we continue to read this. We'll be back 50 years in the Church of Rome uh, next Wednesday, this Wednesday. Continuing on, and I'm reading this to you folks so that you understand how serious this is. And as I've been reading Bloodlands by Stephen Snyder, this is what the Jesuits did in the 20th century. They killed 14 million people inhabiting the lands between Berlin and Moscow. 14 million. I say at least. Probably more like 20 million. And the Jesuits did this using their agents, Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler. 
And do you know what Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler had in common? Why, according to one of my sources that I quote in his book from my PowerPoint, Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin walked the grounds together of that huge Schönborn Castle in Vienna, Austria. And that castle belonged to the, the Habsburgs, who were high knights of Malta and contributed to the destruction of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in World War I. So the Jesuits were already using their little boys, their little stooges, the wicked Joseph Stalin and the wicked Adolf Hitler, grooming them to be mutual crusaders in a pincer movement for the destruction of what historically was known as the Pale of Settlement, which the book calls Bloodlands. Okay? And they will destroy millions of Protestants, millions of Orthodox, and millions of Jews. To the utter delight of Jesuit General Vladimir Lerachowski, a Pole. This is the beginnings of these kinds of things in Poland. Remember, Poland suffered horribly in the war. And you Polish men know that your government in absentia in England was hated by Joseph Stalin. And Joseph Stalin called for the death of your great General Sikorsky. Because General Sikorsky repelled Joseph Stalin in the 1920s. And so Sikorsky went into Britain in exile. And so the wicked British intelligence, including wicked sinners like Kim Philby, murdered Sikorsky, causing his airplane to crash in the Mediterranean Sea. All of this is done by Joseph Stalin, Winston Churchill, and all these Jesuits working for the destruction of the true nationalism of Poland. And they would do the same thing when they would kill the Polish president, all those leading men several years ago in an aircraft accident deliberately bringing down that aircraft and killing all the Polish leading men of the country. And you know who would do it? The KGB. Aided by the CIA. Because they've always worked together. The OSS and the NKVD have always worked together. And you might as well add the Nazi Gestapo and SS always worked together with NKVD and OSS also. It's an international intelligence community, and Poland reaped the horrible, awful, terrible fruit of this in World War II when the Polish uh, nationals and patriots decided to rise up against the Nazis, the German Nazis there inhabiting Warsaw, and they were promised that Stalin would come to their aid. And you know what Stalin did? He, with his third, with his filthy red army, sat on the outskirts of Warsaw and watched the German Nazis Nazis mass murder somewhat 60,000 Polish patriot men. Because we got to kill down these Polish patriots so when we put Poland under Stalin, there won't be any serious resistance to the occupying Red Army. And this was all decided at Yalta. So I'm, I'm for you Polish people. That's why I have Jack on here telling you about it. You Poles have shed more blood and suffered more probably than any other Eastern European nation. And it's all been at the hands of the Jesuits using Stalin and Hitler. And FDR and Churchill. Continuing. On the 28th of September, there were 30 persons in prison, several of whom, having proved an alibi, were discharged. And each of the accused that consented to become a Romanist was immediately liberated. That's called freedom of conscience, Jesuit style. <laughs> I'm going to put a sword to your throat, boy, until you profess to be a Roman Catholic, then I'll let you go. You know what they did to the Serbs in World War II? They got the Serbs all together, many in certain places, and said, you're going to convert to Roman Catholicism. This many Serbs converted, and they said, now that you're within such a good faith, we're going to cut all your throats. That's right. 
you need to read a book called uh, Yugoslav Auschwitz and the Vatican. Tells about the horrible, terrible consecration camp of Jasenovic in Croatia where they murdered hundreds of thousands of Orthodox Serbs. Kind of like Billy Clinton killed thousands of them uh, during, for 77 bombing days. That's right. Jesuit trained Bill Clinton bombed you Orthodox Serbs. Going on. <clears throat> The commission retiring from Thorne left 66 persons in prison. The town requested permission to send a deputation to Warsaw to defend its cause, and it obtained leave to send two delegates. It demanded also that the Jesuits should be cited before the royal court for having stubborn witnesses and procured false depositions. This was refused, and the protest of the town against such illegal proceedings was not received by any tribunal in Poland. That shows you the power of the Jesuits over the tribunals in Poland, exactly as their power over every federal district court judge in this country. Yep. The affair was presented to the Diet, which had assembled at Warsaw on the 2nd of October, but it would have sent it to the Assessorial Court. The Assessorial Court was composed of the Chancellor, the Vice Chancellor, the Referendaries, and several other legal, legal, um, what do we have here? Reading the footnote here. So, legal, legal uh, officers of the court. It took cognizance in matters of the fiscus of many other public affairs, and of many other public affairs, and was a Supreme Court of Appeal for the towns which were governed by the statute of Magdeburg or German municipal law. Remember, Magdeburg was a Protestant city. That's why dirty, filthy FDR and Winston, and Winston Churchill bombed the northern cities of Germany in World War II to oblivion. They bombed Magdeburg into oblivion. They bombed the Protestant city of Lubin in northern Germany into oblivion. They bombed Dresden, the Protestant city of Dresden, the most beautiful city on the Elbe, into oblivion. There was a book written on it called Slaughterhouse-Five. You need to read it. But this is a little precursor of World War II, what the Jesuits had accomplished. This is a precursor of about, oh, 200 years before that time. It says here, this high court of justice, composed of the first judicial officers of the state, would certainly have given a fair trial to the accused party, namely the Protestants, but it was swamped by the addition of 40 senators and nuncios, amongst whom there were three bishops, and the 40 new members being all the, under the influence of the Jesuits. Just like the attorney who, who that, that Italian Roman Catholic attorney for, for Clay Shaw, CIA connected, was the attorney for him making sure that Clay Shaw got a not guilty verdict, making sure also that the Irish Roman Catholic judge in New Orleans, Aloysius Haggerty, made sure that he would not admit evidence into the case that would lead to the conviction of Clay Shaw. That was a Jesuit court. When Jim Garrison put Clay Shaw on trial, it was a Jesuit-controlled court. And all you people in Louisiana ought to be angry about it. Because they killed and covered up the murder of our first Roman Catholic president who resisted the Jesuits. Going on. Thorne perceived its danger, and his delegates tried to do everything in their power to avert the impending calamity and to obtain as much time as possible in which to move in their favor several foreign courts. The monarch, perceiving the excitement that prevailed in the Diet, wished to protect, protract the adjudication to the conclusion of the session, but some fanatical nuncios threatened to dissolve the Diet by their liberarian veto, and it was vexed and it was fixed for the 30th of October. 
The prosecutor, a Jesuit, accused the inculpated party of having committed a crime against all Christendom by offending Catholicism. Kind of reminds me that it was a Jesuit uh, U.S. attorney that was the one that was prosecuting F. Tarper Saucy for an income tax charge. You read about it in his book, uh, Rulers of Evil. Jesuits in the Justice Department. Why do you think we don't get any justice from the Justice, Justice Department? Because it's run by the Jesuits of Georgetown University through their students and agents. There is no justice in the American Justice Department. They ought to call it what it is, the Injustice Department. Because if it was really a Justice Department, they'd go after the entire Roman Catholic hierarchy in this country under the RICO Act and a few other acts for their conspiracy to overthrow the government of the United States and call and demand that they be expelled. But that ain't happening in America here because we're living in Roman Catholic Jesuit-ruled United States of America. And for you white men that don't understand that, you need to read my book. Vatican assassins wounded in the house of my friends. The truth needs to be told. It needs to be told now. We're running out of time. He goes on. The prosecutor, a Jesuit, accused the, the inculpated party of having committed a crime against all Christendom, all Protestants, all Baptists. Roman Catholicism was never part of Christendom. It's Romanism. It is not Christianity. It's Baal worship Babylonianism. Read the book, The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. Read Mystery Babylon Religion by, uh, by, by, that, uh, by that one gentleman I have his book here, Mystery Babylon Religion. Read that one. You can read a hundred books. There's thousands of books on it. Go get, the, get my book, get my uh, reference library on my website, 1,100 titles, loaded with books proving the Jesuits are subverters and perverters and Roman Catholicism has never been Christian. against all Christendom, against all Europe, by offending the royal authority, and against Poland by offending religion and authority together. And he demanded that all the churches, schools, and colleges should be taken from the Protestants and given to Roman Catholics, and that all the charges and offices of the town should be disposed to the total exclusion of Protestants. That's what the Jesuits want. They don't want one Bible-believing man of God in any place of government. Not one. Got to call him a bigot or a sexist, or a racist, or something, but we got to keep those people out of government because they're going to do the right thing. They're going to bring in biblical, biblical mandates and principles in governing. They're going to limit their powers pursuant to written constitutions. They're not going to assume more powers than has been delegated to them. Well, we can't have those people. we got to have these absolutists subject to the Jesuits, prostitute Protestants like George W. Bush, prostitute Protestants like Ronald Reagan, prostitute Protestants like Billy Clinton, prostitute Protestants like Lyndon Baines Johnson. I mean, all these wicked sinners and pimps of the Pope are against true limited constitutional government and are nothing more than the commanders-in-chief of the military government imposed on March 9, 1933, until one guy came along and wanted to put an end to it, and he was a Roman Catholic named John F. Kennedy. And you Roman Catholics ought to be irate about it. But you're nothing but a bunch of cowards, just like the Protestants, aren't you? Just like the Baptists, a bunch of cowards. Refusing to do your duty, to tell the truth, though the heavens fall, as Jim Garrison said. But I'm praying that God will convert you convert to your heart and convict you of your sin that you might truly repent and start to do the right thing while we have some time before we go into martial law and rioting and raping and pillaging in every major city in this country and famine which Stalin used on the Russian people that's going to be used on us this could be stopped this could be set back if you'll do your duty will you Bohosky the advocate who defended the cause of Thorne contended that the commission of inquiry being exclusively composed of Roman of Roman uh, Catholics was illegal. And he was right. 
Kind of like having a U.S. Supreme Court composed of seven out of nine that are Roman Catholics and the other two are Jews busy serving the Pope. You call that Supreme Court a place of justice? It's a Supreme Court of infamy. And any Roman Catholic that wants to resist the design of the Jesuits with limiting powers of the, of the government and, and allowing, for, for example, gun ownership in Washington, D.C., as did Scalia, why we'll poison him. And we won't even have an autopsy and we won't even have a commission to investigate his death. That's the power of the Jesuit order, able to kill a Supreme Court justice in broad daylight, and nobody says anything, including those sinners on Fox News who are looking out for you. Yeah, and MSNBC, and Lawrence O'Donnell, and all those other Roman Catholics loyal to the Jesuits. That the witnesses had not been confronted, and that no defense of the accused persons was accepted. His observations excited the anger of judges as well as the, of the auditory. The, and cries of reprobation were heard that, quote, a Roman Catholic dared to excuse heresy, unquote. Pahosky, undismayed by these cries, insisted that, a, quote, a new impartial inquiry ought to be made into that case and the evidence of the commission rejected. And this is a Roman Catholic. This is Pahosky, Pahosky. He was a Roman Catholic that wanted to do right. And they attacked him. It's like Hale Boggs. Hale Boggs says, Oswald never shot anybody. Hale Boggs was on the Warren Commission. Hale Boggs was a Roman Catholic. Hale Boggs was a Knight of Columbus. Hale Boggs said, well, Oswald didn't shoot anybody. And it just so happened that he and what Nick Bagich, while they were in their airplane coming down from Alaska, just happened to crash. And his wife, Lindy Boggs, a dame of Malta, never said anything about it. Coming to her husband's defense, that's called a loyal Roman Catholic. When they kill your own husband and you don't say anything about it. That's real Romanism. Going on. His efforts, however, proved unavailing. The defense of Thorne was not received, and a decree was given on the sole evidence of the commission. It was promulgated on the 16th November, and the chancellor prefixed it by the decor by the decoration, quote, excuse me, that God has not received an adequate revenge, unquote. That's what the Roman Catholic chancellor said. That's why you want a Protestant chancellor. That's why you want to be in a historically Protestant court of equity. These Roman Catholic chancellors are worse than at law. They'll really give it to you. This decree condemned, remember, a chancellor gives a decree. This decree condemned the President Rosner to be beheaded and his property to be confiscated and given to the crown. This is what was done in the Dark Ages. Accused of heresy, the Inquisition shows up at your door at 12, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning. The Inquisitor's dressed in red with a big high-pointed hat like he's a member of the KKK. That's what they look like. And you see his eyes through the mask. This is the Inquisition. You are under arrest. And they'd take that man, they'd confiscate all his property to the crown and take and torture a confession out of him and then behead him or burn him with fire. This is exactly what's happening in Poland here in the 1600s. The 1700s. We're supposed to be in the modern era. Oh no, the holy office of the Inquisition is still raging in Poland at this time until Napoleon will formally do away with it in 1808. Going on. The crimes imputed to him, to Rosner, were only those of negligence, which even if proved would not deserve such a punishment. He was condemned because, as it was maintained, he had not liberated the Jesuit pupils. So we're going to kill a man for not liberating a man that had been kidnapped by the Jesuits? That's called Jesuit justice. You like that? That's what we have all over this country every day, Jesuit justice. by which he gave cause to the riot. Because he had not quelled the riot, he had not directly called together the city council, had not given to the troops sufficient orders, in short, had not done his duty. So that even if all the accusations specified in the decree had been true, Rosner would have deserved to lose his place, but not incur the penalty of death. 
The vice president, Zernicki, condemned to the same penalty, was accused not merely of having connived at, but even of having excited the riot. When the Jesuits were throwing rocks and their students and firing their guns at the crowd. Huh? The Burgers, Hinder, Mohop, Kristoff, Hertel, Becker, Mertz, and Wuntish, accused of having been the leaders of the riot, were condemned to be beheaded. <laughs> the Burgers, Karswitz, Schultz, Haft, and Gutbrod were condemned to the same penalty. But as they were accused of having added blasphemy to their other crimes, they were further sentenced to have a hand cut off before execution and their bodies burnt. That's Jesuit justice. Fire and sword. For those who would resist the Jesuits and their students. That's what they would do here if they could. That's what they do to Brother Eric if they could. Of course, they have the CIA here, and they could just send out an order and have them kill me anytime they wanted to, apart from the Son of God's protection. That's how they rule here. No matter, you know how many people Bill Clinton is responsible for their murder? Oh, it's over 50. You think he did it? Oh, no. Jesuits maintaining his power. That's how it happened. The good old Billy Clinton knows the power of the Jesuits. He would never cross them. They made him. They educated him at Georgetown. They made him president. He did all their bidding. And he could do anything he wanted to do and never be removed from office. That's Bill Clinton. That's his wife, Hellcat Hillary. That's who all you left-wing socialist communists want to put in the White House. Another little Jesuitist to work with her Jesuit husband and further calling for Jesuit confiscation of all our guns, huh? So they can do to us what they did to the Polish people here in the 1720s and 30s. Going on. The first of them as the most guilty was to be quartered. You know what that means? That means they tie your hands to one horse, to ropes, and to another horse, they tie your feet. And then the horses gallop off in their own direction and rip you in half. That's called being drawn and quartered. The Jesuits like that. They enjoy that. They enjoy ripping up their enemies. Probably gives them some sort of sexual gratification, the perverse that they are. Going on, several persons besides were condemned to imprisonment, fines, and corporal punishment. The sentence was not to be executed until the accusation should be confirmed by a solemn oath, taken in presence of the royal commissioners by the prosecuting party and by the reverend fathers, Jesuit, and six laymen. So now they're going to give false oath. They'll swear falsely. Because the ends justify the means. The Jesuit Machiavellians will do anything they can to bring about the ends that they want. And that's the utter destruction of the Protestant Reformation, the utter imposition of papal rule through their agents, whatever they might be called, and the elimination of a middle class, of an armed middle class with gold and silver coins private banking, and no income tax, and with protective tariffs to all goods coming in this country. The Jesuits would utterly kill anything and anyone to prevent that from happening. That's why they killed uh, the great Pennsylvania Congressman Louis T. McFadden when he was against the Pope's Federal Reserve and the, and the, and the whore, wicked Emergency Banking Relief Act. And he said it's concentrated all power in the hands of the government, all banking power. They killed him. Going on. It was not sufficient for the Jesuits that they wreaked their vengeance on Protestant individuals. The degree, the decree struck a blow at Protestantism itself. It was ordered that the city council, as also the town militia, should be composed half of Protestants and half of Roman Catholics. The officers of the latter to be all Roman Catholics. Give them the supremacy now. It's called Roman Catholic supremacy. That's what we have in this country all the time, every day, in every way. Show me one Protestant that's in the news. And don't talk to me about Huckabee. The Church of St. Mary was to be restored to the Bernadine monks from whom it had been taken at the Reformation, as was the Protestant 
as was the Protestant court, as was the Protestant uh, college. Protestants were forbidden to print anything at Thorn without the previous approbation, that means approval, of the Roman Catholic bishop. And they could only have schools outside of the walls of the city. That's right. Get to the curb, boy. I'm going to kick you Protestants to the curb. Get out of my town. I had a president. There was a president Lancaster, of a Lancaster Bible College when I went to it years ago from 1980, 79 to 81. His name was Gilbert Peterson. And he said at one of our chapels one day, he said, the Catholics build, build on Main Street and the Protestants build on, build on Side Street or Back Street. He was right. The Diet confirmed the decree promulgated on the 16th of November and its execution, which was entrusted to the Hetmans, or commanders-in-chief of the armies of Poland and Lithuania, was ordered to take place on the 15th December. We'll be back in a moment to finish up our narration of this horrible Protestant persecution that will end in the murder of innocent men, as will happen here if things continue as they are. Back in a moment. You're listening to 24-7 World Radio. Hey, John Phillips, back with the broadcast, continuing on today with reading from this tremendous work concerning the Jesuits persecuting the Protestants in Poland. We continue on page 452. The President Resner and the Vice President Zernicki of Thorn, who until that time had been free and could have retired to a place of safety, were arrested on the 18th of November, pardon me, by an aide de camp of Laborinsky, Laborierski, Laborierski, who arrived at Thorn, the little Protestant town of Thorn, with 150 horsemen. The town was thrown into the greatest consternation. Nobody having dreamt of such a sentence, which even astonished everyone at Warsaw. You see, at that time, if there were Puritans in that town, if the town had been manned by Puritans, they would have all got their weapons out and there would have been a shootout with 150 horsemen. You're not taking these Protestant, the Protestant president and vice president of our town, you Roman Catholics. That's what Puritans do. Puritans do not submit to the temporal power of the Pope. We go to guns first, and if that kills us, then I guess we're done. That's the Puritan ethic. That's the Calvinistic Puritan ethic where we do not submit. That's why the Covenanters in Scotland said, no, those Calvinistic Covenanters who were Puritans, they said, no, after Charles II had been restored to the throne, that fanatical Protestant Roman Catholic. And from 1660 to 1688, for 28 years, King Charles hunted down and murdered the Calvinistic Scotch Covenanters because they refused to fight in the king's army, and they refused to pay his tax. Why aren't we taught that in school? Because we're taught to be good little Jesuits. Pay your taxes, even though you don't know why. I mean, you owe them, but you got to know why. Pay the taxes and sign up for the draft so you can fight the Pope's crusades. That's the American way here for under military government since March 9th, 1933. Going on, we read. The town was thrown into the greatest consternation, nobody having dreamt of such a sentence, which even astonished everyone at Warsaw, astonished all the Roman Catholics in Warsaw. Danzig, which was a Protestant town, addressed a petition to the monarch, the Roman Catholic monarch, against the iniquitous sentence. The ambassadors of the emperor of the Tsar Peter of, Peter of Sweden interceded. So now this Tsar Peter of Sweden, he's a Lutheran. He's going to intercede 
The king of Prussia, who's a Protestant Lutheran, wrote himself to the king of Poland, interceding in favor of Thorn, the Protestant city of Thorn, and engaged several other sovereigns to do the same. The Senate, or city council of Thorn, presented a petition to the king, praying at least a suspension of the execution, but the Jesuits, abetted by Labraminsky, succeeded in accelerating his term by a week. You see, the Jesuits did the very same thing when they caused the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 16, 1685. They would kill the French, the great Frenchmen, who st tried to stop that revocation. And they used Louis XIV to, to drive out all the Protestant Huguenots out of France. 500,000 were driven out to kill 500,000. This is the most, one of the most important things that happened in Europe at this time, the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in France by Louis XIV, overseen by his Jesuit advisor, Pierre Lachaise. And so they're doing the, pursuing the same policy here. The Jesuits accelerated the term by a week. And by the way, if Oliver Cromwell had been here at this time, <laughs> he'd already been murdered a century before. But if he was active in the 1700s at this time, he would have sent a letter to the king of Poland and said, you either stop these persecutions of the Protestants of Thorn, or I myself and the, and the Kaiser of Germany, who's a Lutheran, and uh, the king of Sweden will be in alliance to invade your country. I also have an alliance with the Tsar of Russia, too. To invade your country. We will attack it from all sides. Or you let the Protestants of Thorm go and expel the Jesuits. Now, that's what Cromwell would have done. And the Jesuits were so afraid of Cromwell that they would have immediately dropped it. And you see, that's all they, that's all they, dude, they, all they fear is power. They have no morality. There's nothing that binds them to, what, to right and wrong. All they fear is financial power, somebody with money resisting them, or political power, someone with political clout resisting them, or someone with military power resisting them. That's all they fear. Money, political power, and financial power. That's why they have monopolized it all. So for the most part, there isn't anybody to resist them. Except us little guys here. Going on. There was one circumstance which seemed to prevent the execution of this atrocious sentence. That's the beheading of all these Protestant men. For what? For not having the Jesuit... Student released? And induced many members of the tribunal which judged the affair at Thorn to sign it. It was the condition that the Jesuits should confirm by an oath the facts presented in its indictment. A, in this indictment, a condition which the law absolutely required from the prosecuting party for the execution of such a sentence, and which, on this occasion, it seemed impossible could be fulfilled on account of the sacred calling of that party, which, it was presumed, would restrain them from making an asservation, asservation or an oath equivalent to the signature of a death warrant. So they want to get these Jesuits to say, okay, say it under oath, and if you're not going to do it, you've got to release the guys. The commission entrusted with the execution of the decree assembled on the 5th December in the town hall of Thorn, and the accused and accusing parties were summoned to their presence. The last named party was represented on the, that occasion by Peter Walensky and other Jesuits. When the, oath, when the sentence was read and the con confirmatory oath was required, Peter Walensky answered with an assumed mildness, that as a clergyman, he was not thirsty of blood. Right. <laughs> Religiosium non citier sanguinum. But he made a sign to two other Jesuits, Piotrowitz and Schubert, who bent their knees and pronounced the required oath. You see, the ends justify the means. They can lie, cheat, and steal to bring about the means of killing these accursed Protestants. 
of thorn. Six laymen belonging to the lowest of the populace did the same, although the decree required that they should be of a condition equal to that of the accused parties. We're talking status here. Okay, of the parties. And in a note here it says, Stramisius, a Protestant author, says that, quote, the papal nuncio in Poland, Santini, did not approve of the affair of Thorn and forbade the Jesuits to take the oath required for the execution of the sentence, unquote. It is also said that the same papal nuncio had obtained a delay of the sentence, but that when it arrived at Thorn, all was over, and that he sent an accusation against the Jesuits to Rome. Well, good for that bishop, but too late. The sentence was executed on the 7th December, now, the day the Jesuits attacked Pearl Harbor with their Japanese Navy. The aged Rusner, a man universally respected and who had given proofs of his patriotism by valiantly defending the town against the Swedes, was beheaded at an early hour in the yard of the town hall. They beheaded that righteous Protestant German Polish man, a Lutheran. He rejected the proposal of saving his life by the abjuration of his religion and died with the constancy and resignation of a Christian martyr. Of course. He refused to retreat. He refused to recant. We have observed that he could have easily have saved himself by flight, but he was conscious of his innocence and moreover afraid to draw by such a step fatal consequences on the town which he governed. He himself announced his condemnation, saying, quote, God grant that my death may give peace to the church and to the town, unquote. And he meant the Protestant church, not the Catholic church, not the Jesuits. His body was buried with all the honors due to his station, his status. The vice president, Zernicki, who according to the sentence was much more guilty than Rosner, was respited and finally pardoned. All the other condemned were executed. All of the other condemned were executed, with the exception of Hertel, who embraced Romanism. So they cut off all their heads, too. Just like the Jesuits cut off the heads of with thousands of people during the French Revolution, because they ran the directory. They ran Robespierre. They're the authors and the inventors of the guillotine, with their Masonic agent, Dr. Guillotin. Yeah. The Jesuits love beheading because they know that the soul and spirit of a man is in his head. It's not anywhere else. So when you sever the head off the body, the soul and spirit now have been severed from the body, and there's no coming back to life. That's why they taught the Guarani Indians in South America to cut off the heads of all white men, Portuguese and French, Portuguese and Spanish, lest they should come to life again. And you can find that in Thompson's the Footprints of the Jesuits under the title, under the chapter of Paraguay. Going on. The church taken from the Lutherans was consecrated on the 8th December and the Jesuit Wierowski pronounced on that occasion a sermon on Machib B1, chapter 4, verses that's Maccabees, which is the Roman Catholic Vulgate, has nothing to do, Roman Catholic uh, uh, Vulgate, which has nothing to do with the Bible. Okay. Maccabees, Book 1, Chapter 4, Verses 36, 48, and 57, in which he apostrophized, apostrophized the commissioners who had put the sentence into execution as men more like angels than human beings. So now we're going to call the men that killed these innocent Protestants angels. This deplorable event did great injury to Poland and the public opinion of Europe and gave cause to loud declamations and bitter invectives against our country. The king of Prussia was particularly active in his efforts to excite the other Protestant monarchs and addressed on that occasion the kings of Sweden, Lutheran, Denmark, Lutheran, and Great Britain, Anglican, and even that of France as one of the guarantees of the Treaty of Oliva. 
The Protestant monarchs and the states of Holland addressed remonstrances on that subject to the king of Poland. So the Netherlands did so. And the English ambassador at the German Diet, Mr. Finch, pronounced at Ratisbon on the 7th February 1725 a most violent speech on that subject, threatening Poland with war if the wrongs of the Protestants should, be, should not be redressed. And I say amen. That's what Cromwell would have done. Cromwell sent a letter to Mazarin, the head of France, when the fanatical Jesuits and their, their French killers were massacring the Vaudois, the historic Bible-believing French Vaudois, the Waldensians. They cut off their heads and played a game of cricket with their heads, polo. And Cromwell sent a message to Mazarin. Uh, we're not going to engage any treaty with you. You better stop this persecution of these Vaudois. And also Matt Cromwell sent a letter to the Pope and said, I know you're behind this, and you better get this stopped right now, or you're going to see my warships in Civita Vecchia, and we'll be bombing, cannoning the Vatican. Now that is a man of God. That is a Christian. That is Oliver Cromwell. That's all that Rome respects. It only respects a fist. It only respects power, resisting it. It's like the mafia. It's like the CIA. It's like all the secret societies. All they respect is power, man. And if you think you're going to talk them down when they're busy seeking to kill you and impose, impose temporal power, you're quite out of your mind. You need to trust God that he'll intervene for you. And do something. Raise up somebody to resist them. <clears throat> Peter the Great was on the point of declaring war against Poland. Now, this is the same Peter the Great who threatened war, made preparations to war against Poland, threatened, declared, he said, uh, Peter it was on the point of declaring war against Poland because Peter the Great, the great Russian czar, had expelled the Jesuits in 1723. He knew the Jesuits were behind this. So in 1724, he's getting ready to go to war on Poland for what they're doing to the Protestants. So you know what? In 1725, Peter the Great's going to die suddenly after he eats a bowl of porridge. He's going to get the poison bowl. And made active preparations to invade Lithuania, a project which death prevented him from putting into, ex into execution. Yeah, he was murdered in 1725. Thus, the Tsar of Muscovy, whose influence had elevated Sunni's whiskey, the most active enemy of the Protestants, and who had destroyed their liberties by the Treaty of 1716, was a few years afterwards ready to make war under pretense of avenging their wrongs. The, ju the juridical murders of Thorn are the more painful to contemplate that Poland had been free from such cruelties in times when almost every part of Europe was inundated with blood shed on account of religious differences. That's when the Jesuits were inciting all the wars in Europe, 30 years war, the Puritan revolution, etc., the war against the Dutch Republic. Um, and even so, at so early a period as 1556, when the influence of Lipomani caused a thorn, the, ju the the judicial murder of some Jews and a poor Christian girl. A general cry of indignation was raised throughout the country. Yet in 1724, the Jesuits could raise a general cry for vengeance against the imaginary offenders of the divinity. That's the host. That's the little Jesus cookie. They turned into Jesus Christ when they said, hocus pocus, shalimoxus, whatever they do. Far be it from us to excuse Poland on the ground that there is no country which has not disgraced itself by much greater enormities. What is wrong in itself can never be justified by the example of others. We think, however, that a close and impartial investigation of the circumstances accompanying that nefarious transaction will show that the blame of it was, was unjustly laid on the Polish nation, whilst it should entirely rest with that antisocial faction which made the nation a tool for the attainment of its objects. That anti-national faction was the Jesuits, making Poland a tool for their objects. So, 
Continuing. It is very easy for the strongly organized body governed by one chief extending its ramifications over all the country. The one chief is a Jesuit general. The organized body is the Jesuits. And influential with all the classes of society to produce a general excitement on any subject whatever, but particularly on one connected with religion. And the more so if such a body the Jesuits, have at its command two such powerful engines for working upon the minds of the people as the pulpit and the confessional. Was it then extraordinary that the employment of such means produced their natural effect on the mass of the nation, and that the voice of some few enlightened persons was silenced by the outcry of the multitude? We ask every impartial and reflecting reader whether it does not happen in every free country that the opinions of the great majority, generally called public opinion, are sometimes so misled on subjects connected either with religion or politics by the arts of agitation that prudent persons, notwithstanding their superiority over the multitude, must either submit or give place to others who partake of or seem to profit by its determination? Such was the case in Poland when the agitation which the all-powerful society of the Jesuits had produced by means of misrepresentation directed the election of the nuncios to the Diet and chose the commission for investigating the th affair of Thorn. The court which judged this affair being composed of the first officers of the state ought certainly to have been more above the influence of popular clamor and the bigotry of the petty nobles but it was swamped by the addition of 40 new members chosen by the influence of the Jesuits. There are, moreover, two other circumstances which contributed greatly to the ferocity and injustice of them. In the first place, the undue interference of foreign courts, which was easily construed by the interested party into an encroachment on the national independence, which it was necessary to repel by all means. And secondly, the clause already spoken of as appended to the sentence, which appeared to render its execution almost impossible. It was impossible to suppose, as we have already said, that the reverend fathers who assumed such character, such a character of meekness and sanctity, would on that occasion so far forget their clerical character as to invigorate by oath a warrant for bloodshed. These two circumstances contributed more than anything to the passing of the sentence. Many signed, thinking to show thereby a defiance of the foreign interference in national affairs and hope to prevent its consequences by annexing to it conditions which in their judgment never could be fulfilled. Thus we think is the proper view of the case, and we are astonished that no author, whether Roman Catholic or Protestant, has to our knowledge considered it in such a light. It is true that this affair was a subject of much comment all over, over all Europe for some time after it had taken place, and when the passions were strongly excited. But we do not know that it ever has been since investigated in a calm and dispassionate manner. The interference of foreign courts to which we have alluded, instead of bringing relief to the Protestants, served only to render their condition more painful. The remonstrances of Protestant monarchs couched in strong terms, and particularly the violent speech of the English minister at Ratisbon, being read to the Diet in 1726, excited general irritation against these courts. And the vengeance that could not reach them was wreaked on the Polish Protestants, who were prohibited at the, at the same Diet, under a penalty of death, from seeking the protection of foreign powers. A proof that this was produced by jealousy, of the national independence is afforded by strong opposition of that diet to Rome, for one of its members pronounced a violent speech against the Pope's interference with the affairs of the Polish Church, which he concluded by the words, Regat suam ecclesiasm. The papal nuncio having published a censure of the proceedings of the diet, his jurisdiction was immediately suspended, and the diet confirmed several ancient laws limiting the power of the Pope, and enacted a new one by which the Polish clergy were, for, clergy were forbidden to accept any dignity from Rome. The Pope endeavored to abolish that law by the influence of the bishops. Nevertheless, it remained on the statute book. A good thing did happen, limiting the power of the Pope, but look at this. The murder of Protestants in Poland. It's like the Jesuits are using the Muslims to murder those Christians in Syria and in the Middle East and in Egypt. As they're going to do here. Because the church of Jesus Christ in this country is apostate. It has departed from the faith. It has departed from the Reformation Bible. It has departed from preaching the doctrines of grace, salvation by grace through faith. It has departed from exposing Romanism. And you know what? According to Jesus Christ in John 15, it's 
it produces no fruit, it's good for nothing, and it's going to be taken by men and burned. That's what happens to the vine, the, the, the branches of the vine that don't bring forth fruit. That's what's going to happen here. That's what happened in Protestant Prussia. May God cause us to truly repent, us Christian men, to repent of our sins and to truly seek God and to truly go back to serving him and resisting Rome while we can. Lest what happened in Poland be repeated here. Lest what happened in the bloodlands from 1939 to 1945 happen here. Brother Eric John Phillips, thank you for tuning in today. I have a book, Vatican Assassins. Go to my website, vaticanassassins.org, 247worldradio.com. Download my book for, what, twenty four ninety five something like that. You can get the e-book for four thirty five forty 40 bucks, something like that. You can get several other things for sale there. Please go and sign up for OneCoin. Go to 247worldradio.com, click on Business, scroll down to OneCoin, reserve your place there. I'll be having OneCoin. Uh, people on hopefully to talk more about it but I maintain it's the investment for the moment and we need to get involved in cryptocurrency so go to OneCoin sign up sign up underneath me there and you'll help the ministry you'll help yourself also go to Amazon.com on my business section if whatever you want to buy on Amazon you just go there that'll help the ministry and you get what you want off Amazon and uh, I'll be on YouTube, Lord willing, hopefully next week. I have some few things to take care of. Please pray for me tomorrow. I will be in court with my petition that the court may give me the decree stating that I am the beneficial owner of the estate of the all-caps name, Eric John Phelps. That is my great prayer and desire. Please pray to this end for me also. Because when that happens, things will change for the better for all of us. Because I'm going to teach you how to do it too. <laughs> So, please pray for me 60 seconds a day. May the Lord be with you as you seek to do His will. Uh, read His Reformation Bible. Please pray for the other broadcasters that are on the website, on the radio station here. Please pray for the radio station. We are trusting God that He will send uh, the amount of money I prayed for, the 50000 by the end of the month. We can put it in the radio station a few other places. And uh, pray that you men will do some serious financing and prayers in resistance to what the Jesuits have planned for us in North America. It's time to help. It's time to pray. It's time to give. Send your gifts to RBT, P.O. Box 306, Newmanstown, Pennsylvania, 17073. Also, you can listen to this broadcast without downloading an app. Just go to 247worldradio.com forward slash mobile, and people can download and listen to this. And lastly, may the Lord bless you, for he is coming. Fair enough. Feature story news and.